the Carnival of Champions was a three-day boxing event that took place in 1892. Now, the main event on that card would take place September 7th, 1892, and that was Jim Corbett and John L. Sullivan. It was a 21-round grueling battle. You see, John O'Sullivan was named the Boston Strong Boy. And he would walk around and say that he would beat any son of a bitch in the world. Gentleman Jim Corbett was a bank teller. And he was somewhat of a clean cut young man, and he called him the gentleman. And he'd be scheduled to face John O'Sullivan September 7th, 1892. New Orleans, Louisiana. But they wanted to make an event out of this. So they had a three-day boxing card. September 6th, 1892. You had George Dixon, known as Little Chocolate. He would face Jack Skelly. Now that year in 1892, a lot of events took place, such as February 2nd was the longest boxing match under modern rules, 77 rounds in Illinois, between Harry Sharp and Frank Crosby. March 11th was the first public basketball game located in Springfield, Massachusetts. The General Electric Company was merged of Thomas Edison and J.P. Morgan. April 21st, the Black Longshiremen strike. The event was for higher wages in St. Louis, Missouri. That was a big deal at that time. August 13th, United States Black Newspaper African American began publishing from Baltimore. August 27th, New York City's Metropolitan Opera House caught on fire. Took two days to officially get rid of that fire and meet it back to cold. September 7th, Gentleman Jim Corbett, John O'Sullivan. 21 rounds a boxing exhibition in New Orleans. You see, John O'Sullivan was known as the Boston Strong Boy. And he would go walking around stating that he would defeat any son of a bitch in the world. Gentleman Jim Corbett was a bank teller. Somewhat of a clean-cut young man and he was notified that there was a boxing match opportunity against John O'Sullivan. You see, previously he fought Peter Jackson, known as the Black Prince. And that fight was 61 rounds of heated action. Turned out to be a draw because John O'Sullivan stated that he would never defend his title against a black fighter. So round after round, they would see if Gentleman Jim Corbett would be able to take out the Black Prince. He was unable to. He stopped it and called it a draw. And this put Jim Corbett in great position to face John O'Sullivan on the night of September 7, 1892. Jim Corbett would outbox John O'Sullivan. They would both have to use five ounce gloves, and this would be John O'Sullivan's first time fighting without gloves. You see, he was a bare knuckle champion. And the purse was $25,000, winner take all. Jim Corbett would be victorious. Now, this is going to become a three fight series.
first fight would be George Dixon and Jack Skelly. I'm going to make this a three part video. I'm Scrapbook Boxing. And I want to talk about the Carnival of Champions with you right here on the Museum of the Forgotten Fistic of Series. You see, George Dixon, known as Little Chocolate, was born July 29, 1870, in Halifax, North Scotia, Canada. He died. January 6th, 1909, in New York's Bellevue Hospital. Now you see, Bellevue Hospital was a psychiatric ward. And we'll get into that a little bit later on in the video. But Dixon would move to Boston from 1887. He would become a Bantamweight champion by knocking out Luke Wallace of England, London. Knocked him out in the 18th round, June 27th, 1890. He would become the first black champion to win a world title in any sport in history. First black fighter to win the world boxing bantamweight and featherweight champion of all time. He would discover shadow boxing. And he would discover shadow boxing because in the area in which he lived was infested with flies and mosquitoes and bugs. He would constantly swat those bugs to the point where he made an art form out of it. And he would catch almost every bug in his path. And when spotted one day and asked, what are you doing? He stated, he was boxing his own shadow. So the art of shadow boxing was formed. Thanks to Little Chocolate, George Dixon. July 28, 1891. He knocked out Abe Wells in Australia. Knocked him out in the fifth round of San Francisco. October 4th, 1897, he lost a 20-round decision to Charlie Smith. Now, Charlie Smith and George Dixon would have a fight series, but Charlie Smith was some fighter, and he would gain a verdict over the great champion, George Dixon and annexed the World Featherweight Championship. Now George Dixon would eventually lose his title January 9th, 1900. He'd be knocked out by Terry McGovern in the 8th round. He was 20 years a professional fighter well over 1,000 fights, many of them undocumented, many of them exhibitions. From 1886, 1906, he would have 33 world championship fights under his belt. He was elected into the Boxing Hall of Fame, 1956. You see, George Dixon became an outstanding boxer because whenever he went to the side of the ropes, he'd be hitting the calves and the ankles with knife sticks and bricks. He was forced to stay in the middle of the ring. And he created the tight circle boxing where you would stay in the zone, in the pocket, and move around in a circle. He was able to make that happen with beautiful combinations. He learned that through shadow boxing. 
You see, George Dixon, very underrated, created a great deal of skills in the ring. Now, when Dixon became Bantamweight champion, June 27th, 1890, at the age of 20 years of age, he would face Edwin Nuke Wallace. And Nuke Wallace was from London, England. And he would defeat him. He was the new Bantamweight champion. Now the world was his, he thought. Because up until that time, he had been crowned the only black athlete to be crowned world champion. And this was big in the black community because George Dixon was originally from Canada and he would come to the United States and be bigger than light. He was well accepted because of his fair skin complexion. He could fit in on both sides of the fence, one would say. George Dixon earned $17,500 in his second title fight. Now, Nuke Wallace was born December 13th, 1867 in Binghamton, England. He died August 6th, 1912. He stood 5 foot 2 inches and he weighed 109 to 116 pounds. Now, according to studies, Wallace was fast on his feet. He once held the Bantamweight champion of England. You see, Wallace had tons of amateur experience. He defeated fighters such as Charles Smith. Jack Mills, Charlie Jones, William Wallace, Charlie Roberts, Bill Goody. But he never had a professional fight. Until the age of 19. Now, 1892, the Carnival of Champions showed separations between Dixon and Black America. New Orleans was the location of the events of three days of boxing championship affairs at the Olympic Club. However, slave ships had entered the borders of the U.S. The schooner Thomas Hunter was department in Norfolk, Virginia, October 17th, 1835. It arrived in New Orleans, Louisiana, on November 11th, 1835. It was reported five slaves identified with a full first name. The schooner Wildcat, which departed from Charleston, South Carolina, September 1st, 1832 arrived at New Orleans, Louisiana, September 24th, 1832, which reported six slaves identified only by their first name. You see, at this point, African Americans began losing their identity. In 1807, the Congress would outlaw African slave trade effective on January 1st, 1808, in 1820, declared it to be private punishment. So any death that took place during the course of this action was not law. Owners still had rights to transport slaves from state to state for selling purposes. And they wind up in New Orleans. Not understanding American history, 
Dixon agreed to perform at this event. He was scheduled to face Brooklyn's Bantamweight. His name was Jack Skelly, John D. Skelly. He was born February 8, 1870, Brooklyn, New York. Located in Flatbush section of Brooklyn, New York. He died May 28, 1953 in New York. Stood 5 foot 4 inches, weighed 115 to 127 pounds. Now Jack Skelly began his professional debut against the world champion, Little Chocolate, George Dixon. There were three Jacks that began boxing the same year. Jack McAlphick, who also participated in this event. Jack Dempsey and Jack Skelly himself. These three men worked together at the Coopridge in Brooklyn, New York. William Reynolds, Skelly's backers, told the press that he knew of no better fighter than Jack to represent the white race and fighting as quote-unquote colored boy George Dixon. Because he didn't drink, he didn't smoke tobacco leaves of any kind. Now remember these words because they will go to haunt George Dixon at that event in New Orleans. Now Jack Skelly had a stunning amateur background. Between 1884 and 1888, he won a New York's Amateur Band Away Championship when he defeated three men at New Burst, New York. He would win a Featherweight Amateur Championship. 1889, Jack Skelly won the International Amateur Championship. November, Skelly won the National AAU Featherweight Championship. September 6, 1892, New Orleans, Louisiana. The World Featherweight Championship was on the line. The weight limit was 116 to 118 pounds. And George Dixon was an overwhelming favorite at 3 to 1 odds against a professional debut boxer by the name of Jack Skelly. You see, Jack Skelly had never fought a professional fight up until that evening. And he was announced as Brooklyn's amateur star. Now, the referee was John Duffy. And during the course of action, John Duffy kept on shoving George Dixon away to separate the two men. He would shove him in the chest, shove him in the neck. In an aggressive and aggravating fashion. Now George Dixon, who was warned by the referee, Skelly was down once in the eighth round, third round, and seventh round. You had black sports writers. And gentlemen around the ring with velvet crush suits and high leather boots. They smoked pickle leaf cigars. George Dixon hum humiliated the Southern white establishment so badly. That would be the very last mixed bout between a black and a white fighter for over 60 years. You see, Scully was a bloody mess. The Brooklyn, New York, Daily Eagle reported. Now, what really upset the African American community was when George Dixon, along with his white counterparts, was seen sitting on top of cotton bales, smoking freshly picked tobacco leaves, and drinking moonshine 
A reporter showed this information to the black press. And Dixon was vilified and not wanted in New Orleans. Now, if you remember back when I told you that Skelly's cornerman had reported to the press, you wouldn't have a better white fighter to beat the black fighter George Dixon because he didn't smoke cigars and he didn't drink. Well, that was reported back in New Orleans. It was designed to vilify George Dixon. When George Dixon lost the title, white America had no more use for him. October 3rd, Brooklyn, New York, Jack Skelly and George Dixon had exhibitions. They could only have these exhibitions up north. They couldn't have it in the south. Because it was their match that separated black and white fighters from fighting for over 60 years. Now, Jack Skelly was no saint because he and nine of his troops were arrested for not paying a bill at the Noonan House in Saratoga, New York. George Dixon died two days later after entering New York's Bellevue Hospital. His body was viewed at the athletic club. Now, Bellevue Hospital was located 462 First Avenue in New York was founded March 31st, 1736. Now the thing about it, it was a psychiatric unit that would hold 1,500 beds. And George Dixon was placed there. Although George Dixon was some fighter, but he was not quite embraced in the African-American community. Because George Dixon was not an advocate of any kind. He was a boxer and he was originally from Canada. But he didn't quite understand the struggles that the African-American community had faced and was under. He was accepted on both sides, and he played both sides. I want to show you the original program and newspaper of that event of the Carnival of Champions. Now, this is the uh, Frank Leslie's Illustration Weekly. Let me focus this a little better for you. You can see here, September 8th, 1992. I have the original paper here. And as you can see here, John L. Sullivan, James J. Corbett, their fight took place September 7th, 1892. Jack McAuliffe, Ironically, him and Jack Skelly, along with Jack Dempsey, would turn professional together, and they both worked in, worked in Brooklyn together. He fought Billy Myers. George Dixon and Jack Skelly would fight September 6, 1892. And it took place at the clubhouse. The brutal prize ring exhibition at New Orleans. And I have the entire event that took place inside this magazine. It tells me step by step, blow by blow of exactly what took place. So when I tell you I have information, I have information. I, I, 
I don't show everything that I have here, but I got the information. And there's tons more where this came from. Let me show you some more things that I can show you. Once again, this is September 8th, which was the following day of the John L. Sullivan, Jim Corbett fight. But the George Dixon and John Skelly fight. His name was John, but they called him Jack Skelly. Took place September 6, 1892. I told you once before I had a book with George Dixon. This whole book is George Dixon, over a thousand pages. Little Chocolate. He was some fighter. Tom O'Rourke. talks about George Dixon in this particular article. Salute to George Dixon. Salute to my subscribers. Thanks for hanging in there with me. This is video number one on a Carnival of Champions. I'll be going through John O'Sullivan and Gentleman Jim Corbett in the next video. Here you have George Dixon and Terry McGovern. All right, salute.